Okay, thank you very much, uh, Council Member. Uh, at this time, um, I'll ask the City Clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Sanchez? Here. Council Member Ibarra is not present. Council Mayor Pro Tem? Here. Council Member Charette? Here. Council Member Reynoso? Here. Council Member Calvin? Present. Council Member Alexander? Here. And Mayor Valdivia? Present. Okay, seeing that we have a quorum tonight, we will um, ask the members of the audience. If you do, you have about 15 more minutes to submit a speaker split uh, slip in the back. At 5.45, we'll cut it off and um, we'll entertain some public comments. Uh, Mr. City Manager, today's setting is a workshop mode. We'll remind council members there's no policy um, decisions tonight. It's simply a receive and file presentation from staff and the floor is yours. Thank you and good evening. Um, yeah, the purpose of tonight's workshop is to introduce and discuss potential projects and programs <clears throat> that are available to the City of San Bernardino that, that would be intended to address certain aspects of the, very many, of the very many complex issues related to homelessness. There are a few important issues we need to keep in mind as we go through this discussion. First of all, these are options. Um, these are options we want to explore going forward, but they are certainly viable. We have not, we're not presenting pie in the sky stuff. This is, these are things that are actually viable. And they have the potential, like we think, to contribute to the overall goal of reducing homelessness in the city of San Bernardino. One of the primary concerns from our perspective, from the staff level perspective, is that the ongoing costs associated with these options um, are, need to be realized, recognized, and contained. Cities generally do not receive funding of a magnitude that is sufficient to pay for these types of programs over the long haul. You will notice also during our presentation that there's going to be an emphasis on partnerships. They're all critical with other government entities, with nonprofits, with faith-based organizations. But of course, the most important one of all is with the County of San Bernardino, which has got both the statutory authorities and the funding that are not available to cities, including, of course, the City of San Bernardino. <clears throat> if it's the Council's pleasure, uh, we are certainly prepared to have an ongoing discussion, meaning a second workshop at some point in, in, at some uh, time to be determined. Uh, to discuss these and any other options, um, and then we would want to also receive additional input from the community and, of course, from the council. Uh, I'm now going to kick it over to Thomas Rice, who has a few additional uh, comments regarding procedural matters uh, for tonight's workshop. Thomas. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Uh, I'm going to kind of reiterate what, what Mayor Valdivia uh, mentioned. This is a workshop setting. Uh, there's no formal action listed on the agenda. Uh, that means you should uh, push those vote buttons off to the side. Uh, don't expect to be using them tonight, but you will be giving direction to staff. You'll be hearing ideas and thoughts, and they'll be looking for direction on that. Uh, but anything that you give direction on this evening will be coming back for a formal vote of a council on a fully agendized agenda in a, a future time. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, with the uh, permission of the, uh, of the council and the mayor, uh, I will now ask Nathan Freeman. Uh, the Agency Director for Community Housing and Economic Development, and Cassandra Searcy, who is our Deputy Director for Housing and Homelessness, to come forward. They are going to be leading the discussion this evening. So, uh, Nathan and Cassandra, please. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Nathan Freeman, your Community and Economic Development Director. At this point, I'd like to introduce our Deputy Director of the Community and Economic Development Department, responsible for housing, homeless, CDBG, and a whole host of other things, Cassandra Searcy. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the Council. For today, we're going to have a homeless workshop, and part of our presentation will include an overview I hope you guys can hear me clearly. It will include an overview of the state of homelessness in our city. We're going to outline the current legal landscape, and we're going to present to you some potential solutions to help mitigate homelessness. And, oh, on the next slide. To the uh, point of order, Mr. Yes, yeah, th Thank you. Just a question. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation printed here, which we got mm -hmm. via email earlier, and I mm -hmm. saw it, looked through it. But we've also attached to the agenda 
quite a more bit more data. Which one are we going to be following, or are we going to try to cover them on both, or what? Yes. So, um, council. It looks like some duplication, but yeah. So let me explain, Council Member Charette. Initially, um, I was going to go. Um, I don't know if I should say go big. I had two presenters who were going to be present at tonight's workshop, but instead. It was such an extensive PowerPoint presentation, and it was going to be some lengthy um, additions with the presenters that we kind of scaled it back a little. And so I'll go over that general information. So in, to answer your question, it's the uh, PowerPoint. I think there's only 27 slides versus 54. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK. So bear with me here. So the chart that you see before you today, I really want to lay down some background information, establish uh, the foundation so that we're all on the same page. The information on the chart above pretty much outlines our point in time count data from 2018 to 2019. Now this information is relevant because it shows that there's been a steady increase in homelessness in our city. Um, please note that the year 2021 is intentionally left off because HUD allowed cities to have a waiver out of COVID safety concerns. But in 2022, we see that our homeless numbers ranged 1,350, of which 992 were unsheltered. Yes, we have the highest concentration of homeless individuals in the county, but that's not, that's not why I'm bringing this to your attention. I'm pointing this out because um, as I further discuss legal matters, there was an infamous case, or there is an infamous case called Martin versus Boise, in which cities have been informed that they run the risk of a federal lawsuit if they enforce anti-camping ordinances without having adequate shelter beds. And although um, this federal mandate came down, it didn't really provide clear directions. It left cities, in a sense, feeling like their hands were tied. But um, District, U.S. District Court Judge David Carter provided some guidelines where he's outlined that a 60% threshold is a reasonable expectation for cities to provide shelter beds to their unsheltered population. So 60% is still a lot. It's better than 100%, but it's also manageable. If you look at our unsheltered numbers, we are at 992. Now, let me just, let me just state this. I think everybody in this room understands that our point in time count numbers are not an actual reflection of the number of homeless individuals on our streets. Experts will tell you you should probably take your numbers and double them if you want a, a more accurate reflection. But for the point, purpose of complying with um, some federal guidelines, it is very useful. 60% of our 992 count gives us 595 total shelter beds that are needed in this city. We actually have 170 shelter beds that are available and active online, and that number comes directly from our county's continuum of care. With that said, we could actually have more shelter beds because there are some shelters that have religious affiliations and they do not require state and federal government funding. And if those shelters reveal themselves, that's to our city's credit. But one thing we know for sure is that we have 170 active shelters. So when you do the math, that leaves us with a target goal of 425 shelter beds. I know that may sound daunting, but I promise before this presentation is concluded, I will show you that this number is very much attainable. Still looking at data from our point in time count number, it's important to understand the characteristics of our city's homeless population. And the reason for this is because we can't talk about solutions until we clearly understand the problem. So as you can see, homeless men outnumber homeless women two to one, that's no surprise. But 44% suffer from a mental health disorder, 59% are chronically homeless, 60% have a substance abuse problem, 80% have no income, and 27% have become homeless for the first time. What do these numbers actually mean? Well, basically what it's telling us is that if we're gonna talk about any real solutions, we must incorporate components that address mental health and substance abuse disorder counseling that has some type of job training and placement assistance connected to it because 40% of our city's homeless population is between the age of 25 and 39 years old. 
40%. So if we're gonna help our homeless community, we must attach some type of workforce training and development program to this. And then we have 27% who became homeless for the first time, so that means we have to stop the bleeding. For every three individuals that we help become housed, we have one new person who's entered into homelessness. The bottom line is the city needs to focus on comprehensive goals that are community-based, that help not only individuals who are currently homeless, but also help those who are at risk of becoming homeless. And so now let's just talk quickly about some citywide impacts. The rise of homelessness, homelessness in the city is very visible, and it is negatively impacting our public, our business, and our local environment. And furthermore, um, the rise in homelessness is causing a negative impact financially to the city as it affects multiple departments, code, parks and recs, uh, public works, police department. The, let me see, in 2020, uh, San Bernardino County uh, is, um, authorized a cost analysis, cost analysis study that showed that Inland Empire cities are paying on average $31,873 per person per year just to manage homelessness. We're not talking solutions, we're talking managing. And that's because of manpower hours that are misdirected towards services that are deemed maybe not essential. And it's also the rise in cost of resources to repair, replace, and clean up. $31,873 just to, 873, just to manage chronic homelessness. Per person, per year, exactly. So real quick, before we talk about solutions, I have to identify the current legal landscape. We have the infamous case called Martin versus Boise. And basically, I'm gonna summarize, this case pretty much told the city of Boise that there are that their anti-camping ordinance was unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Because the city of Boise was citing individuals for sleeping in encampments, for sleeping outdoors, yet it lacked adequate shelter beds. Okay, so cities know that you're not supposed to do this because you risk a federal lawsuit, but as I stated earlier, what is the magic number? Well, now we know what it is, because with the Orange County versus Orange County Catholic workers, District Court uh, Judge David Carter allowed Orange County cities to recognize if you provide shelter beds for 60% of your homeless population, then you truly minimize the risk of being sued in federal court. This case um, was a set of precedents because there were 13 cities listed in this lawsuit. And those 13 cities band together and formed what's called the North Spa, the North Service Planning Area. They pulled their resources and they developed low barrier navigation centers that helped the homeless population within their city's boundaries. And how they did this was they looked at their point in time count numbers. So let's say I'm the city of Irvine, I have a thousand homeless individuals. Well, yes, I'm gonna contribute more towards the spas and the, the navigation centers than somebody who might have a homeless count of 100. So it shows that a collective effort could be reached and it's very successful and still moving forward with Orange County. Now, there are some cities that say, I don't wanna hear anything about a federal lawsuit. I just know that I'm tired of our parks being destroyed. I'm tired of my city um, being trashed. I want these encampments gone. Please note that you are going down a slippery slope. And as we look at the neighbors to our west, the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles, both were listed in a federal lawsuit in March 2020. And the reason was because they were accused of not providing adequate shelter and services to their homeless individuals, namely those that were in homeless encampments. Now the city argued that we don't have the resources. We don't have the infrastructure. It's the county. The county has the funding from the state and federal government to provide mental health services, to provide substance abuse counseling, and most counties are linked to the housing authority. So why are you looking at us? And the county pushed back and said, I don't think so. You have hundreds if not thousands in your city limits on Skid Row, this is your problem. So for two years, they're going back and forth and really nothing is being resolved. But in April of 2022, the city of Los Angeles settled for $3 billion, and what a billion would it be, in which case, they have agreed to provide housing 
shelter bed services, and uh, other resources to the amount of, I want to say, close to 16,000 units over the next five years. They have to provide services to everybody except those who have a mental health disorder because the courts agreed that is a county issue. County did not initially agree to this, but in September of 2022, the county ended up settling, not quite as much as the city, but still significant, $236 million, in which it agrees to provide shelter beds, housing, and homeless outreach for LA County residents. The goal of this is it's better for cities to just be compliant and try to meet the threshold that was um, provided by Judge David, District Court Judge David Carter, try to meet that 60% threshold. With that said, you can resume your anti-camping ordinances, you can clean up your parks and public areas, and you can restore that sense of balance to communities. That's the goal. Ms. Searcy, questions for you. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I, I want to, um, let's back up to the homeless data. Um, the, the case by um, Judge Carter, yes. when he um, suggested that the 60% of the homeless population within a city or jurisdiction, um, is you suggesting that that's precedent? Well, it's arguable that it's precedent, but it's Mr. Um, Rice. Talk to us legally. What are the challenges with Judge Carter's um, position and opinion, and is it precedent? It, it, it's not precedent uh, in, a, in a legal sense. It's a settlement agreement, uh, but it'd be very similar facts to what the, the county of San Bernardino, the county of Riverside County, or any other county. Uh, not named would face, which is essentially the allegations from Boise, uh, the Boise case, which is you are penalizing folks for being, uh, for camping or sleeping on the streets, and you don't have sufficient beds uh, to accommodate them. What Judge Carter in the Orange County case did was worked with both the plaintiffs, worked with the defendants to come to a settlement agreement to resolve the case, and they collectively agreed on that 60% number. Now, I think uh, Ms. Searcy is correct. That is, that's probably a good, a good number to use, a good benchmark to shoot for, because we know in our district at least one of those judges in that courthouse believes that that's an acceptable number to shoot for. However, we could get a different judge. A, a lower number might pass muster. A, high, a, a higher number might not pass muster. But it's, I think for the purposes of a city with the numbers, looking at the table that was shown uh, by Ms. Searcy, Obviously, we're a long way short of 60%. Understood. So shooting for yeah. 60%. My, my, my question, a, Mr. Rice, is, is that the 60% is simply a benchmark. Absolutely. It, it's, it's not a legal more, guarantee. It's and not it a not legal precedent. mandate. You are correct. Okay. Um, the Boise case, did it provide a specific number? I, my understanding that it was 50%. N no, the Boise case So that case the threshold would be higher with Judge Carter. The Boise case left us with no specific number. In fact... The Boise case kind of left uh, city attorneys, I guess, across the ninth, the ninth Circuit struggling because there wasn't any clear guidance. What the, what the Boise court said, the Ninth Circuit in the Boise case, I should say, was that if you do not have sufficient beds, you cannot, under the Eighth Amendment, uh, penalize an unhoused person for sleeping or sitting or camping outside. And yet so that sufficient. could be interpreted as 50%. It might be interpreted as 100%. And Judge Carter was trying to get uh, find a number with those plaintiffs. Obviously, 100% is absurd in some ways. Uh, but likewise, you know, lower numbers might, wouldn't, wouldn't meet the criteria. So the operative word in the Boise case is a sufficient number of beds. But it was and remained silent on the number or the percentage. Yes. Okay, uh, Ms. Searcy, uh, you suggest that the continuum of care provided numbers here on that um, slide deck uh, that were inventoried. My question is, does the county provide an update to the county uh, continuum of, is it a county continuum of care or where is that number established? Yeah, the county has a continuum of care and that's something that any organization, city, nonprofit, must go through if it's going to receive any state or federal funding related to homelessness. Okay, and, and so uh, what cities currently in our county um, operate under the statute or the mandate suggested by Judge Carter of 60%? Is there any city in our county that meets that well, or exceeds that? Um, I can tell you right now, the city of Victorville, that was their goal when developing their wellness center using that 60% threshold mark, yes. How are they doing on it? Well, the wellness center is in construction and it's set to be on op 
it's set to be uh, online July of 2023. Excuse me, Mayor, can I just ask sure. really quickly? We have a lot of slides. We're yeah. actually gonna answer some of the questions that you're asking yeah. now. So if we could actually kind of hold questions until okay. we get to the end of Cassandra's so, uh, presentation, that'd be, I think that'd be why, beneficial. Why don't we do this? We will, we'll wait, Councilman and others. I'll hold my questions. I guess just take notes, right? And then mm -hmm. we'll index <laughs> and bookmark and come back to slides. And I Please. apologize, I should have uh, prefaced that before I no got problem. started, yeah. Please proceed. Just, okay, we'll, let, okay, let me catch back up uh, real quick. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about some potential solutions. What we've identified, and again, these are just some potential solutions for consideration of council, but they are best practices um, at the top of the list, we have homeless management information system. The other, another word for this is a citywide database. The county currently operates with an HMIS system, a homeless management information system, in which it collects data and attracts information in terms of services that are provided to the homeless community. But the county is getting ready to switch to a new software database. I think it's called Clarity. They're in the process of working on that. I myself reached out to the Office of Homeless Solutions to see is it possible for our city to be able to obtain data specific to our city in terms of our homeless population, in terms of services and things of that nature. And I was informed, no, that would not be possible. I'm not sure if it's due to prepare, pre, mm, proprietary reasons, but basically no. So with that said, the city needs a system where it can track it's homeless demographics where we can be able to identify our progress, be able to identify any gaps, and be able to utilize our resources and efforts in the most efficient manner. As it stands right now, we have other entities creating our narrative, pretty much telling the city what we're doing, what we're not doing. But if we have cold hard facts numbers that reflect the services that are being provided, how they're being provided, who's doing what, it will create a much more successful and positive narrative. For example, if the city had a citywide database at a glance, we would be able to see the number of shelter beds that are immediately available. We would be able to have uh, outside providers, whether they are homeless housing providers, the Department of Behavioral Health, or even medical clinics, they would be able to utilize access to a limited degree. They would be able to utilize access to our database and be able to um, identify the services that they have online. We could avoid the duplication of services. So if one organization intends to go to Paris Hill Park and provide health counseling or um, housing vouchers or something like that, then we would already be able to see, well, we have that service covered in Paris Hill, but there's um, a need on the west side or there's a need in the, the first district or what have you. And we could better um, spread out services so that we can cover a broader area. Um, with a database, we can collect information that will be useful as we pursue different funding options because we would have cold concrete numbers and we would not have to rely on any, any um, entity like the county doing the annual point in time count to tell us where we really stand. We will be able to have these numbers up front. And then it will also help to forge partnerships because we can identify the type of services that are being provided but also the gaps. So a citywide database would be very useful in tracking our measures our progress measures, and like I said, it would also be able to assist our vulnerable population more efficiently. And I'm sorry I talked over it, but this is pretty much <laughs> kind of what this would look like. So as you can see, at a glance, we would be able to identify our hot spots. Where are our homeless, where are, where are our homeless um, encampments? Where are the clusters of our homeless demographics? We can see the number of individuals that are being served on a daily basis. We can see the different types of uh, programs that we have in place, uh, where we fall short, um, where we have a need, and it's all at one glance that can be utilized by various departments within the city as well as external um, entities like I mentioned before with DBH or medical clinics, things of that nature. Our city also needs a dedicated homeless outreach team. Now, it's true the city does provide ESG funding. We actually had a couple of organizations that had been um, allotted ESG funds. One of those organizations rescinded the money, 
So we still have one dedicated team that's providing homeless outreach services, and they do a phenomenal job. The problem is, is that the one organization only has two staff members dedicated for this task. And the city is over 62 square miles. So we kind of need some comprehensive services. Two individuals are not going to do the task. I can tell you that other cities use contracted homeless outreach vendors, and it's been very successful. Cities like our neighbors next door, Riverside, Fontana, various cities in LA, and Orange County. They use a homeless outreach or a street outreach team that is um, boots to the ground. They're able to go out in a broad area and immediately assist individuals or families addressing crisis uh, situations, providing um, outreach services, connecting individuals to immediate housing, be it uh, short-term, rapid rehousing, permanent, or even motel vouchers. And then also our homeless outreach team would have a housing navigator attached. And that's really important because you need somebody who is, who's able to build relationships with current landlords, with uh, residential facilities. We can't just rely on motel vouchers. And unfortunately, most if not all of our shelters are at or near full capacity. That's part of the problem. Um, with homeless outreach, it will also be a, a situation where Let's say you have somebody who is currently homeless and they're not ready to come indoors or come in off the street. That homeless outreach person can still continue to work with that individual to assist them with um, needed services, be it mental health, uh, be it medical services, things of that nature, because it's not going to always be so easy to assist somebody who's chronically homeless and you need someone who has that level of expertise that knows how to work with the homeless population, who knows how to engage, and who knows how to build rapport. So with that said, I'm not, uh, I'm not stating that the city can't still work with local providers. What I'm saying is the city needs a dedicated team that answers to the city. And with having a homeless outreach, um, a comprehensive homeless outreach team, we can provide services to every single ward in this city. So if there's a crisis emergency, if there's an immediate need, we can send the home reach out, homeless outreach team to that area to make sure that there's comprehensive coverage. Part of homeless outreach also includes a mobile shower expansion. Now, currently, the city is utilizing Community Action Partnership, and they do a wonderful job. They actually have four different locations that they provide uh, mobile shower services um, to, and there are stationary locations where they work with nonprofits. But there are individuals that are not always able to get to those locations. And by having a mobile shower expansion, we are able to use a 28-foot trailer that provides full restrooms and showers as well as a laundry facility. And this mobile unit could work uh, co um, collectively with the uh, mobile outreach team to go to various locations throughout the city. This is actually something that is very useful in the sense that we, always, we already use mobile showers, but we don't have that laundry facility component. And I think it's something that uh, is sorely missing and it's something we can incorporate. Now, I mentioned the 425 beds and you kind of wondering, you know, how are we gonna get this number down so we can safely go ahead and reinstitute our anti-camping ordinances? Well, we have what's called home key projects. Um, to be specific, these are um, projects that are provided by the state of California. They are, um, oh, okay. <laughs> These are projects um, provided by the state of California, specifically HCD, Housing and Community Development. And I can tell you that Home Key is probably the most extensive grant program available that will allow entities like cities and uh, uh, housing authorities and even tribal communities to build housing units and interim housing to address its homeless situation. So presently, the city is working closely with San Bernardino Valley College and Lutheran Social Services on two potential Project Home Key Round 3s. Now, I have to tell you that Project Home Key Round 3, the NOFA is due to be released sometime in spring of 2023. That's either March or early April. At this point, there is no communication that there will be any additional rounds. You, we are in a situation that with Project Home Key, the funding is issued on a first come, first served rolling basis. 
and uh, you pretty much need to be shovel ready. And so as a result, even though this NOFA is not coming out to spring, we're still moving full speed ahead in developing these projects. With San Bernardino Valley College, the city is looking at granting land so that the school can develop 60 non-congregate housing units for its homeless students and homeless students with families. And along with this housing project, it will include on-site support services to include anything from job training, counseling, um, even family services. The demographics that the school is looking at would include members from the Tay community, transitionally aged youth, uh, individuals who are from the foster care system or who have aged out of the foster care system, and then families in general. But there will be, the key indicator is that these individuals are homeless. And it's, again, it's for the students and for their families. For Lutheran Social Services, they actually are looking to establish a 200 non-congregate unit facility that will act as a navigation center on their own property. And what's unique about the Lutheran Social Services um, project is that it will have an on-site medical clinic that is uh, FQHC, which means it's, has, it's, federally, it's a federally qualified healthcare center. It will also provide mental health services, substance abuse counseling, it will have daycare services because although this particular um, project is for men, it will also assist men with families, men with children, excuse me. Um, this project also intends to provide community resources uh, that includes some level of job training and placement. Together these units would, or together these projects would bring the city a total of 260 non-congregate units or shelter beds and I'm saying shelter beds, but really it's interim housing. That will diminish some of our 425 shelter beds that we, re that we require. So just hang in here with me. I want to kind of show you what the makeup of these units would kind of look like. If you're not already familiar, the cost of construction has gone through the roof. And so the city really needs to look at non-conventional methods or alternative construction methods. What you see before you are prefabricated modular units that are constructed locally. We actually have several manufacturers in the Inland Empire that specialize in prefabricated modular units. Now what's neat about these is we can go single story or double story depending on the density. Each unit for the uh, most part is around 80 square feet and inside that's enough space for either a twin bed, full bed, desk, chair, storage unit, um, so it's pretty much it's ample space. And then for families, so for example, um, there are some navigation centers that use this component, and let's say they reserve 25% for families. So typically what they do is they may take two or three units and open it up so it's more expansive, and that way families can stay together. The neat thing about this is that it removes a major barrier. So unlike traditional shelters where you have families and dad goes to one shelter and mom and kids go to another shelter, in this case, families can stay together. Couples can stay together. If somebody had a pet or an animal, they can bring their pet with them. Um, it, it, it removes a lot of um, impediments that normally might keep somebody out of shelter. Another fascinating feature about this particular unit is that uh, they all have insulation and they all have individual HVAC systems. So we're not putting anybody in sheds. There's cooling and heating systems, and each of the units have their own air compression, so nobody is sharing any air. And since we live in a world that is COVID-19, that'll probably be with us for quite some time, or any other airborne virus, we minimize that threat. Because if someone does have an airborne illness, or if someone is sick, they could be self-contained in their room. And that would not cause for the entire campus or facility to be shut down. We could still move forward. Just a quick question, Cassandra. Mm -hmm. Those three images are the same, the same item, right? Same homes? Oh, uh, so actually they kind of look the same. So what you're seeing on the mobile, oh, let me go back. So um, what you're seeing in the bottom uh, corner with the, mobile, with the um, housing units on the truck, yeah. Actually, uh, it's, the similar, it's the same manufacturer, but it's not the same product. So the product on top, this two-story, is the same manufacturer of that mobile unit on the bottom. But to the left of the screen, that's a different manufacturer. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. 
So here's a, another uh, example. Um, I'm trying to be careful and not say any names of the manufacturer, but here's another example that shows you what it looks like on the inside. And so we're talking about something that, as you can see, it's very comfortable, it provides dignity, and it provides a level of safety and security. If a homeless individual were to come to, um, whether it's a home key project or whether it's an interim housing facility, they would be able to have their own private space. They would be able to leave for the day and handle their personal affairs knowing that their items are still safe and secure. They would be able to lock their doors. They would be able to bring their pet inside with them if they wanted. Um, it feels like home. It doesn't feel like a shelter. It feels like home. And so some other key features, just so that you kind of can understand what we're talking about. We're not talking sheds here. We're talking about um, durable units. Um, they are made with, yes, 30% recycled plastics. They have steel frame construction. They are guaranteed for at least 20 years. And what I really like about the uh, modular fabricated units is that they can be taken down. They can be relocated. Uh, they can be stored. They can be repurposed. Um, they're not put on any permanent construction or concrete. If you can see, that is decking, and so what, it, what they are is they're secured to the deck. But let's just say homelessness is eradicated and we never have to worry about it again. Well, we can find a different purpose for this or we can take it down altogether. And they can be put up pretty much anywhere, including a parking lot. So let's talk about navigation centers. What you see before you are examples of navigation centers in different locations throughout Southern California. They were, navigation centers for the most part was something that was popular in Northern California and in the last couple of years they made their way to Southern California. And in a nutshell, basically what they are, they, uh, navigation centers act as a one-stop shop, providing comprehensive services to individuals and to families who are homeless. And I don't know if you could tell, but within the navigation centers, what, if you look at them, they don't really look like a place where where you would find homeless individuals. They're supposed to be established to provide needs to the community. So again, whether you're homeless or whether you're at risk of becoming homeless, they blend in to wherever community they're situated in and they provide a multitude of services, which I'm gonna share with you now. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I have this slide. Before I do, the whole point of a navigation center is that you're looking to assist individuals with individualized services. You're looking for a client-centered approach because although we may have um, different demographics of homelessness, everybody arrived at homelessness for a different reason, whether it's for mental health or substance abuse or income or domestic violence or things of that nature. So the whole key in having a navigation center is to have case managers, housing navigators, and other essential services on site to help that individual with their own specialized plan so that they can successfully exit out of homelessness. And then if you see in your packets, you should have had attached some letters of support. There should have been at least four letters of support from Molina, from IEHP, from Dignity Health, and from SAC Healthcare System, which is Loma Linda. The reason why they're attached is because with our navigation center, we have the ability to include recuperative care. And if you're not familiar with recuperative care, that basically is medical respite for individuals who are homeless, who have been hospitalized for acute and chronic health conditions, yet they have nowhere to recover. So where do you send somebody who still needs additional care or they still need IV services? Well, a lot of times they go back to the street and as a result they recycle right back into the hospital. So we have our local hospitals who are <laughs> excited at the possibility of having a recuperative care center to assist that demographic, to reduce the utilization of individuals in and out of the ER, in and out of hospitals. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> wow. And the benefit of having recuperative care is because if you have someone where, um, let's say, a hospital discharged an individual to the recuperative care center, and let's say uh, they've been there for two weeks or four weeks, and although they may have recovered from their illness, they're not st stabilized, they're still not connected um, to any type of housing. 
Well, the recuperative care is adjacent to the navigation center. Overall, it's a part of the same campus. So instead of releasing that person back to the street, they would just transition into a navigation center portion where the case managers can continue to provide that individualized services that they require. So looking up at the screen, here are just some of the components that come with the navigation center. We have already talked about mental health and substance abuse training. We've talked about job training, but also we are looking at simple things that a lot of times people overlook, like mailbox services. If you are homeless and you're trying to get a job or you're trying to get your vital documentation in order, it's very hard to do when you don't have an address and you can't receive mail. We have the ability to have a homeward bound program because there are some people who have been disjointed, disconnected from their family. And it's like, I don't, you know, thank you. I don't really want to stay in this interim shelter. I don't really want to stay in this navigation center. I just want to go back home. And so a lot of times the navigation centers will have that component to send people back to their place of origin. Also with navigation centers, if cities want to be alert and say, I want, I want to avoid the risk of every other city dropping off their homeless individuals at our navigation center, then what you can do with the lead operator is you can set parameters so that San Bernardino residents are prioritized or something similar to where a person has to have a nexus to the city. So maybe they became homeless in the city, they went through a divorce, maybe they lost their job, maybe they were receiving some type of counseling or services, but they're unhoused. Okay, you have a nexus to the city, we can work with you. Otherwise, you have situations sometimes where people mysteriously show up in our city and they need help. Well, it doesn't benefit us to completely ignore them because they're still on our streets. But in situations like that, the case manager would give that person a certain time frame, let's say two weeks, to say, you know, are you willing to do what you need to do to get on your feet and stabilize? If the person is not, let's say they're healthy, able-bodied, they don't want to work. Uh, let's say they're just looking for three hots in a cot. That particular case manager can assist that individual to return to their place of origin. They can get on the phone and they can contact an agency like let's say Adult Protective Services and make it clear that this person is trying to get back to their place of origin and we can assist with that transition. But the bottom line is we can still prioritize residents in our city for the navigation center and still be able to receive state and federal funding. So, we're just talking about potential locations and we're trying to keep an open mind. There's a lot of moving components with the Navigation Center and as such we have to be mindful of several things like the workable space. Um, I am going to transition this over to my director right now, Mr. Nathan Freeman. Is it Nathan? Yes, who is going to be able to elaborate more uh, in depth regarding this particular location that again is just a potential site to allow council to understand how we can outline a navigation center in our city. Well, uh, good evening again, Mayor and City Council. So as you know, uh, Ms. Searcy has only been with the city for a, a short few months. Okay. And her first week on the job, we had a very honest conversation about the state of homelessness in our city. And I really challenged her to think outside the box and to think of new and innovative ways that we can move the needle here in San Bernardino. And I had been, I would say, generally knowledgeable, if you will, about the idea of a navigation center, but she was able to educate me. And so one of my first directions to her as her boss, her first week of work was, we need to pursue this as an option for our city council to consider. And if the council is going to consider this and direct us to move forward, where are we gonna put this navigation center? So my, my second challenge to her was, okay, start looking around, have your staff doing some investigative work to see if the council directs us to do a navigation center, where would it go? So shortly thereafter, myself, my colleague Edie Jimenez over there had a just general discussion with Miguel from the Water District, and he advised us that the School of Hope off of 6th Street, that that lease was coming up and that they were moving out and that at the very least, we should consider this site as a potential location for the navigation center. So can I see the clicker? Oh, sorry. So if you're familiar with the, the School of Hope, it's directly adjacent to the Palm Field Park off of 6th Street, uh, also right next to Santa Claus Incorporated, and also adjacent to a, uh, a large community garden. So we felt like, okay, if the council does direct us, this could be a good location for this. 
uh, the School of Hope uh, is on their way out. Their, their lease is up. They're moving out as we speak. The site is two and a half acres. And what I'd like to articulate for the council very quickly is just if we were going to use this site, and again, subject to council direction, what could it look like? So if you can see on the screen, uh, what we have there is a navigation center potential site layout one. And this would just be uh, utilizing the back portion of the property. And you can see uh, that even with the back portion, we have the ability to uh, facilitate some of the, the things that uh, Cassandra has articulated for you in the presentation. And conversely, if we were to do the entire site, they call it potential site layout two. This is how it could potentially lay out. And our ability to address this, this issue would be increased. So this is just one of several locations that staff is investigating and subject to the council's approval uh, or a recommendation to, to move forward. We could pursue this option even further. So thank you. Um, okay, so this slide right here, more or less just kind of giving a general overview of the location um, of this potential site. Um, even though it seemed like it was in the middle of nowhere, really it's not. It's in near proximity to public transit, to shops, to stores, and that's crucial in order for um, the city to receive state and federal funding to help sustain operations. Oh, if you want to know the, the ward. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. So. Another option, um, and again, this could be a part of the Navigation Center as step-up housing. As Nathan had already outlined, part of the potential space that we're looking at, or any space that we're looking at, we're, we want something that has flat land, we want something that has the potential for growth. This here is an example of a tiny home, and it's not your typical tiny home. This here is something that um, has a lot of high-end measures very dignified. It's something to the point where it doesn't matter if you're homeless or not, you would, you would have a sense of pride living here. This is approximately is 170 square feet. And in this particular model, all of the appliances that you see come with it. On average, it's about 60,000 square feet. This could be something best utilized. Let me go to another photo. Um, this could be, oh, 170, 170 square feet, I'm sorry. 170 square feet. No, <laughs> is that what I said? Oh, no, 170 square feet. <laughs> I'm moving in there for the $60,000. <laughs> okay, uh, let me show you uh, the layout so you can see. As you come in, um, you have a full bathroom. It's ADA accessible. Uh, you have a, a refrigerator, your closet, queen size mattress, and I've actually been to the factory where they make this, and what they did was they used a pull-out sofa bed. So, I mean, it's very nice inside. The flooring, you see all that. Let me go to another picture here. Real nice finishes. Um, this is something that is manufactured, again, locally in the Inland Empire. It's something that could be used as step-up housing for individuals, let's say, who have stabilized, but they um, maybe still can't afford a traditional apartment. Uh, they're working or they have benefits, um, whether it's a single, a couple, or a family. It's something that just can be considered as additional housing. It's a flexible option, and it's just something that we want to throw out there. We're open, we're open to all types of housing um, uh, options at this point. And then also staying on the modular theme, what you're looking at right now are actual apartments, or actually, I'm sorry, yeah, it's a multifamily housing complex. It's here locally in Redlands. It's called the Valencia Grove. I'm showing you this photo because one of the things that we need to do to improve our homeless numbers is we have to increase our affordable housing inventory. And what we're living with, what we're addressing right now is something that's been decades in the, in the making. We have had a lapse of federal funding and state funding in the production of affordable housing. And so what I'm recommending is that the city invest in affordable housing projects that would include modular construction. The multifamily housing unit that you see above is built in Redlands. It was produced in a matter of months. I want to say a total of seven or eight months. 
This is exceptional considering that traditional construction, it would take anywhere from one and a half to two years. Um, the, the far left corner, you see uh, it's a single story house. This too is modular construction. I have personally been inside of this home and the finish it, actually Sanchez has been inside of the home also. Uh, and, the, and the finishes, the finishing touches, it's wonderful. You would not be able to even tell that this was a modular construction home and this is made available to low income families who are at an 80% AMI uh, rating. So it's just something to consider. It's quick to build, it's affordable, it looks well, it blends into the community and I think it would be an asset to our residents who are low income and who need affordable housing options right now and we need to do things smarter, yeah, smarter. In terms of funding sources, there are multiple funding sources that are available to assist with homeless issues that I spoke of and assist with affordable housing. Now, to be quite honest, some of these housing, I mean, some of these uh, funding sources, they're not guaranteed to be around for the next year. So we have to be able to take advantage of them while we have them. But I can say this, homelessness is not going away anytime soon, unfortunately. And our governor has placed an unprecedented amount of money towards addressing homelessness. For Home Key, we know that $750 million is being poured into this next round. Uh, the city already has access to CDBG funding. Uh, we'll have our PLHA funding. We have ARPA funds that we need to expend, and I believe ARPA needs to be fully expended by December 2026, but we need to have the direction on how we're going to spend those funds uh, by December of 2024. Uh, please note that uh, I will come back uh, for City Council um, in November in request of ARPA funds um, for any of the items that we have discussed today, if it's at your satisfaction. But I would definitely intend to come back for ARPA funds so we could move forward with some of the things that we just identified. And then we have home ARP funds, approximately $5 million that's been allotted to this city. The issue is, is that we as a city have to identify a home ARP allocation plan before we can touch those funds and that's something that the housing division is actively working on as there has been no plan in place thus far. But that is money that we can use for homeless services, for housing services, and we desperately need it. And then of course there's HAP funds, the Homeless Housing Assistance Program funds that the county has recurring. The one thing that I did not list because it's relatively new, our county came into $15 million in COC funds for new homeless related projects. There were only two projects that applied. It wasn't that they were necessarily two who were eligible, but there were two projects that applied and they each got $4.5 million to help with operations and construction of their homeless projects. That is money that this city could be receiving if we had a comprehensive plan in place, if we had political will, and we move forward with projects like I just discussed, namely the Navigation and Recuperative Care Center. So just to kind of ease your mind, I know that what I'm presenting to you may seem like a heavy load, and I know where it may seem like the city cannot do all of this on its own, but the city does not have to do this alone and I don't want to get ahead of myself because we have the ability to partner with some entities and I'm going to miss them in a minute because I am getting ahead of myself. But let's talk about next steps real quickly. So the city uh, intends to get direction from city council. If you guys like any of the ideas, any of the proposed solutions that we brought before you, um, please give us clear direction on what you would like us to act on, whether it's one, a few, or all. Um, once we have that, the city can then come back and request some ARPA funding so at least we can start the legwork of moving forward, and in which case we can issue an RFP or a request for um, proposal or a request for interest in seeking a homeless outreach uh, lead operator. We also uh, can enter into an RFP, I know I said MOU agreement, for our mobile shower expansion. Uh, we can move forward with an RFP for um, the lead operator of a navigation recuperative care center. And uh, the city, if so, would use the state approved modular facility structures that I just showed you previously um, that are manufactured by uh, local companies. And then also the city will continue to form strategic partnerships. Again, you have this letters of support um, 
behind one of those packets uh, regarding their full support of a navigation recuperative care center. But there are also some entities like San Bernardino County that I've already been in discussion with that said, if you build it, we will come. Um, we also have entities like uh, San Manuel that have, has expressed an interest in investing in um, some of the homeless related services that I discussed, namely the Navigation and Recuperative Care Center. So we will not be solo here. We definitely have support. People are looking for us to do something. And so let me see. With that said, do you have any questions? Okay, Ms. Searcy, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna take a break and uh, from council and we're gonna hear from the public. Uh, you're here tonight and thank you for your comments here tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call individuals up, please, and you have um, some time to share your perspective and thoughts on this. Uh, Treasurer Tees, Sir Tees, uh, Brenda Flanagan, Cheryl Brown. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Very happy that we're finally having this discussion, this workshop, that Councilwoman Calvin called for two years ago. That legislation has been in place for over four years for us to address. Well, I appreciate the thoroughness of tonight's presentation. I'm so happy to have uh, Ms. Cersei on board. This is not new information. We have had these numbers. We have had these statistics. We have had other cities moving ahead of us in pl providing places to live for people without housing. It seems that on the heels of what we find is another eviction of people in our community less than a block and a half away from here, now the city needs to act because we will end up like the city and county of Los Angeles. Now it's easy to slow a process when you have a nice warm place to lay your head in the evenings, but there are people who are living on the streets, children living in cars, people in hotels and motels right now that cannot wait for another workshop, that cannot wait for another process to take its place because this city has a long history of meeting just to meet and never acting. We have to be 100% steadfast in what we are doing and it is time after the four years that I have stood in front of you in every single meeting to declare a state of emergency on homelessness and housing, open ourselves to available funding beyond what the county can provide in state and federal monies. It is time for the city of San Bernardino to act like the city of San Bernardino and come to the county with a plan in place for how we will be successful with a plan in place for the people to understand that it is not just transitional. We will have wraparound services. We will have affordable housing. We will have market rates. We will be a place that anybody can live and succeed and lay their head at night in a safe environment because we are not just failing ward by ward. This homelessness isn't just second, third, first. Every single ward is being touched by this issue. And these are not just numbers, these are people. These are human beings who deserve dignity and respect in the same city that has failed them for over 50 years. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next speaker, Brenda. You're on, Brenda Flanagan, Cheryl Brown, and Sam Castro. Good evening, uh, my name is Brenda Flanagan and um, I'm one of the people that live a block and a half away that are being evicted as we speak. The uh, red tag just a few hours ago, we weren't given very much of a notice and I can't help but reflect on the time that I've been in San Bernardino, which is since 2013, when um, by the grace of God and a lot of willpower, then thanks to the city of San Bernardino, I took your drug court case, your drug court class for 18 months. I've been clean since May 13th, 2013. <laughs> I changed my life because of a program that you provided and I was hopeless. And now living in that building in the last couple of years, I got a job. I'm a security guard at Stater Brothers. I have respect and admiration of other people. I'm not, I'm not that far ahead to where I can afford three times what I make and, and get into a regular apartment. So this building was a, an opportunity for me. And then we got frauded by these people who came into our city and uh, made a lot of money off of us, and now they're, they're getting away with us being put on the street. Um, I'm terrified, and 
I don't know what to do. I, I need help. We need help. And a lot of people look at the people in the building and think, oh, they're you know, low lives or whatever. I'm not a low life. I work hard. Um, I believe in the city. I believe that your programs are can and, and will work. But we need something regarding this situation. Drug court's awesome. You know, we need a house court. We need something to, I don't know where I'm gonna be tomorrow. But I want an address or I want to help getting one. Um, and we have to send a message to companies or property fraud things like, like what we're going through right now that they can't come into our city and do this because it'll happen again if this goes unanswered. Um, we need to be, like she was saying, we need to be not just all talk, we need to walk the walk. And um, I don't know, homelessness is a real issue and I didn't really think that it was gonna affect me, but you know, it's affecting me right now. And I got my 40 hours in this week and I'm still being affected by it and faced with it and terrified of it and don't know where to look or to go for help. So I'm asking you, help. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl Brown. Mayor, city council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. You know, San Bernardino wasn't like this when I was in 1958 when I got here. San Bernardino was a great city moving forward, had good leadership had people who wanted to be here. And we didn't use, we didn't um, take other communities, other communities didn't run our community like they run now. I'm concerned about that. But I think that what we need to do is contact Rob Bonta and tell him that he needs to get down here and see what's going on in the city of San Bernardino with people being frauded, with people not being able to live. Have him come down here and see that. He's a friend, so I can always call on him. But I want you to know that that's one of the things that I think that we could do in San Bernardino to make it better. And please, use the churches. I'm representing St. Paul AME Church tonight. And our church is concerned my pastor, I want to tell you quickly, my pastor came here from the Midwest. And what he did in the Midwest was because it was so cold in the, in the winter, he opened his church up. And he made the, cellar, the, the basement a place where at least people could get off the street. We have to help each other. We have to do what we can to help each other. And San Bernardino can be great again but we have to have, one, the right leadership, and two, we have to have everybody committed to doing what needs to be done to make that happen. Thank you. Okay, uh, Samuel, you're on. Followed by Jim Penman, Desiree Sanchez, Leonard Jones, and Katrina Smith. Mr. Castro. Hello, my name is Samuel Armando Castro Marron. I've been living in San Bernardino for quite a while now. I want to applaud the city for actually ho hosting this workshop and having solutions for homelessness that aren't more police, because that solution just sucks. Uh, I have been doing a lot of work this past year in the community, especially with the homeless population, working with organizations or people like Kristen from SoCal Trash Army, who's done a phenomenal job of doing a lot of homeless outreach, which I believe is a very important part of this work. So I'm, I'm glad it's finally getting talked about here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see. So I, I'm, I'm happy you guys are talking about that. Um, all I ask is that we continue, we actually take action. It has been a long time uh, that we've faced these problems, like the first public commenter was saying, these are not new, this is not a new information. So I highly encourage you to seek these sources of funding, take this workshop seriously. They've given a lot of really great solutions. So let's just go for it. Thank you. Uh, Jim Penman. Jim Penman followed by Desiree Sanchez, Leonard Jones, Katrina Smith. Mr. Penman. Uh, 
The benchmark of any civilization is how it treats and cares for the uh, low income and the unprivileged. We have to do better, obviously, than we have been doing. I am very impressed by Ms. Searcy's presentation, one of the best I've ever heard. San Bernardino, um, over a year ago in August, I addressed this council, August of 2021, with a suggestion for homeless. And I'm pleased to hear that many of the things that I said then have been repeated by Ms. Searcy. I'm very familiar with the School of Hope location, having served on the board of directors there for a number of years. Campus is ideal, the location it was picked because of the public transportation. Many people may not know this, but for years, San Bernardino was the leader in dealing with the homeless. Other cities came to San Bernardino. The county came to see how we did it. We used, at that time, retired police officers, but we gave them social service training. Having been the director of a social work agency for 12 years, I knew where to go to get them trained. We treated the homeless with dignity and respect. I asked the council for 250000 we paid first month's rent and security deposits for people. We got them into hotels temporarily. But we cannot do that today. We have far too many homeless. Yes, I'm pleased that Victorville and Apple Valley and Barstow and other cities came to San Bernardino to see what we were doing and tried to do it. But they lacked what Ms. Searcy said is one of the primary ingredients. That's the political will. The mayor and council are going to have to take the lead in this effort. We can do what needs to be done. Yes, we have to partner. We have to partner with the county, with social work agencies, and with churches. We did that previously when we were the lead in handling the homeless. We worked with Lutheran Social Services. We worked with the Red Cross. We worked with the Salvation Army. We partnered with them in getting the locations for our people. Now, the majority of our homeless are not from San Bernardino. The majority were dumped here, mostly by LA County. But that does not mean that we can just reject them, turn them onto the streets. We should not turn anyone onto the streets. We need to reinforce and start again enforcing our no camping in public ordinance, but it has to be done in conformity with the laws. We looked at the Eighth Amendment in the city attorney's office when we first started our homeless program over 25 years ago. We did not need to be sued. We saw what would happen if we started enforcing that ordinance and just putting people on the streets. We knew that we would hear from the courts, and Boise, LA, and other cities have heard that. The plan is there, the idea is there. Very pleased you've got this workshop. Let's move ahead, let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Desiree Sanchez, Desiree followed by Leonard Jones, Katrina Smith. Thank you very much. My name is Desiree Sanchez. I'm a senior policy advocate and organizer for the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California here in Riverside and San Bernardino counties. I would like to thank Councilwoman Calvin for continuously fighting to make sure this meeting will be happening. And thank you for the opportunity for us constituents to come speak to you about the crisis that we are dealing with here in San Bernardino. The ACLU of Southern California, we are celebrating over 100 years of protecting our civil liberties and our civil rights. We look forward to continue assisting residents of San Bernardino in knowing their rights, when and if the city continues to illegally raid folks who are living outside. We are here today to remind the council that the $30,000 you are spending per unhoused person a year needs to be completely focused on providing permanent affordable housing and full wraparound services, the housing first model. We will also continue to work with the community organizations that are here tonight and the nonprofits to educate you, landlords, San Bernardino residents of the discriminatory policies that target our black and brown communities that force illegal fast track evictions, which increase our homeless populations, such as crime-free rental housing and code enforcement. Thank you very much. Leonard Jones. Leonard Jones. Okay, Katrina Smith. Yeah, go ahead. Welcome. Thank you. 
My name is Yolanda Brown, but Katrina Smith was sitting next to me. So I would like to share with you what Katrina said. Katrina said that she's been homeless for over 18 months and she's reached out to 211 and she is tired of being homeless. She's raising her grandchildren and she has less vouchers and she was at the library and she happened to notice what was going on. So she stepped in to hear what was being presented. She also stated as we were talking is that she really enjoyed the presentation and she really hopes that someone here at this leadership meeting today, the city council will take action on what was presented. By the way, I'm Yolanda Brown from the city of Ontario and I am also here with the NAACP of Pomona Valley Branch. And I am a representation of COPE, who is here with me as their housing justice subcommittee. And I really hope that you all take action on what was presented here for San Bernardino for the housing. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, We'll bring it back to council members for questions and comments. I want to kick it off with a couple of questions that I have, Ms. Searcy. Uh, fantastic presentation. I want to commend our staff and uh, Nathan Freeman and all of um, your staff members. Ms. Searcy, thank you very much. Very informative, comprehensive, and a robust conversation and presentation uh, presented to the council. Um, first and foremost, um, I believe in a wellness center. For about three years now, I have advocated positionally for a wellness center. As mayor of the city of San Bernardino, I am very aware of the issues facing and plaguing families and plaguing um, our uh, folks that um, are represented in the ho homeless category. And um, for three years, I have uh, attempted to uh, share my vision with council members. And I think now is the time to act boldly tonight on some next steps. I want to encourage the city council to consider to consider these options before us. Uh, it is going to take some political will. It will take some political um, alignment to make sure that we have the resources necessary. And I want to call out our San Bernardino County. The need for them to participate in this process is key. Uh, my understanding is that they are flush with cash. They're flush with money. They're flush with resources. And yet, our county folks have not responded to the city of San Bernardino. So I think collectively I am calling out our county uh, officials to make sure that they are set here at the table to make sure that we have representation from our county of San Bernardino to ensure that we have sus sustenance and sustaining finances uh, for this um, what I would call uh, crisis in our community. Um, secondarily, Ms. Searcy, I think that we need to somehow amend and augment the inventory for PITC. My understanding is that uh, about six to seven years ago, um, the city of San Bernardino was presented um, some language, and the language was changed, and I was a council member, and I remember, and I objected to it, because it was altered and amended to suggest that others um, would uh, be qualified to be residents of the city. So. My, my recommendation is that you look um, with staff and our legal team is to prioritize members um, and somehow um, defeat and amend that language so that it doesn't, it's not an all-inclusive umbrella. In other words, the priorities for this council and the mayor should be that we represent individuals in our city. As you had suggested, members of this community come first. Members in our community who are homeless or categorized as homeless should uh, be, uh, have first a precedent and priority. My, my suggestion is that the language be amended so that it codified in, in, in uh, more language that's restrictive to the residents of the city, somehow either employment or that there is a residence here for 24 months. But I think that the inventory language needs to be amended and augmented. So I'd recommend that um, coming, coming back to this council so that we have re refining and clarifying language on that. Secondly, um, my, my reaction to the Valley College and uh, the Lutheran Social Services, I think it's a phenomenal idea. However, uh, Mr. Freeman, maybe you can answer this as our planning kind of guru and our community development director. Tell me then uh, the noticing requirements. Will they undergo the same planning commission um, 
criteria on these home key projects and what is the status of their application? Are they somehow green lighted versus a normal traditional planning project? And why the variance or what's the difference? Uh, just to be clear, sir, n nothing has been approved. These are ideas right now, so your questions are, are difficult to answer because it's very conceptual at best. All right, so in the hypothetical, because that how, that's how it was posed to us, so let's use hypothetical. Um, so with, assuming that these will come before us and assuming that their intentions are that they will apply and assuming that these um, projects will come forward, uh, are they somehow exempt from noticing requirements because by all intents and, and, and um, uh, by all intents and purposes the surrounding environment of this community let's say at 6th and G Street perhaps I mean I get calls from parents who are already angry uh, upset at the prostitutes walking on 6th and G and now we have additional um, impacts to the quality of life uh, with this proposed project so my question remains Will these um, home key projects undergo the same scrutiny of a planning commission agenda item? So let me give you a, a, just as an example. So this whole concept, uh, Cassandra and I's initial conversations were, I had a chance uh, during my tenure with the city of Riverside to go out to the city of El Centro, who did a very similar project, the first of, it, of its kind that I can think of in the entire state. And it was a collaborative process between the city the county and the school district. And the school district played an amazing role because they're the ones overseeing it. Obviously, these are their students that are in the space. Uh, no corners were cut. Uh, everything went through the, the proper chain of command. And you know, if we go down this road, uh, I anticipate that the city will have some financial skin in the game, if you will, and that will have to be at the city council's direction. So uh, there are certainly many options for the council moving forward. Again, this is just one of them. And anything in the future would be at your direction. So I'll take, I'll take the two paragraphs that you get me, gave me and provided the council that they will undergo and undertake the normal process for planning. Thank you. My next question is the strategic partnerships. Ms. Searcy, you alluded to strategic partnerships which I'm fond of. I think collaboration partnership is key. I called out our county officials and uh, the county budget. But strategic partnerships means more and. What it means to me as a mayor is more robust partnership with the end user, meaning, well, the, the, the provider of collaboration bringing assets and money. So my question really is, does Dignity Health, does SAC Center does all of these uh, four supporters that have attached letters of support, do they come with finances and do they come with money and are they cooperative in bearing and shouldering the burden or are they simply looking for a handout themselves? No, absolutely. Um, so to be specific, the letters of support would be for the Navigation Recuperative Care Center and absolutely it comes with resources and it comes with funding and the reason for that is because they all have some type of foundation that is to support health and housing. And also the state has what's called CAL-AIM. Do not ask me what the acronym means. But basically, um, the state recognizes that a lot of individuals who are unhoused or high utilizers of ERs and hospitals, it is very expensive. It is more cost effective to put someone in housing than it is to continue to pay for their stay in and out of the hospital. So with that said, the hospitals are busting at the seams to help financially support operations on a philanthropic level so we can move forward. Clearly understand the uh, hospital crisis and beds and emergency rooms, whatnot. Thank you very much. Uh, in your presentation tonight, you also suggested that the NOFA, for those who don't understand government language is a notice of funding availability, that the NOFA would be then released in spring of 2023. You suggested then that the governor's office somehow will dispatch or roll out the final uh, tranche of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, will, my question is, will it exhaust all $750 million? So the balance remaining, will it be exhausted? I mean, speculate for us. I know that you could only use a crystal ball. But would you assume that then uh, this would only be a, um, a, a full exhaust, uh, exhausted value of the 750 remaining dollars? Okay, so uh, let me kind of give an example. <clears throat> so I participated in round one of Home Key. 
And in a different city? In a different city. Okay, gotcha. And we, we got the award, and then we got scared. Congratulations. Because it was a, such an aggressive timeline. Nobody had ever seen anything like this, and so we declined the award. Um, when round two came, we just assumed that the application would be the same, the requirements would be the same, but it was stiffer. You truly had to be shovel ready. As a result, the reason why round three NOFA has been pushed back is because the state is still dispersing round two funds. I bet. And as a result, uh, there was a significant amount of funding left over because uh, projects were not shovel ready. So I'm going to guesstimate that round three will probably be similar where we need to be shovel ready and those that are first come first serve with the money. Does that mean there might be funds left over? It could be if you're not shovel ready. So it's shovel hard. ready, that's important to this council as they make and deliberate decisions tonight. Is shovel ready is coming forward with a comprehensive plan as you suggest mm -hmm. in bulleted points over two PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. So I wanna, I wanna be the first to say, yes, let's do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll work out all of the minutia as it comes, council members, but uh, we need to move forward. We need to move forward, we need to be bold. And our city needs to take steps um, to pull down some of these dollars. Mm -hmm. It's time that San Bernardino pulls down the finances and the resources. Uh, we've been long due and passed over, folks, and so tonight, uh, council members, while we can't make a vote tonight, we can certainly say proceed, proceed with haste, proceed in earnest, and proceed with collaborative efforts from all community members. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My final question is the Clarity Program. In your presentation tonight, you suggested that the Clarity Program had an inventory-like system and that the San Bernardino County is essentially the, uh, the champion for the Clarity Program. Again, I'm talking to my county officials. Why wouldn't you want to cooperate with the city of San Bernardino? Why, I'm looking straight at you, and why would you not, why would you impede, why would you obstruct, why would you not share this data with the largest city and the county seat? That, uh, to me, seems absurd. So again, I would renew my request to the county officials and our CEO, Leonard Hernandez, that he direct uh, the members of that data team to share as a plug-in option for our community. Um, we're members of this county. We're the largest seat of this county, uh, the largest city in this county. We're the county seat. We should be at the table advocating and our needs uh, being responded to. This is a paid program by the county. I'm sure they use Esri to plug in. Uh, I don't think we need, uh, here's where I, I differ from you, Ms. Searcy, respectfully and politely. I understand your point and your position of advocacy. However, I believe that, w why reinvent the will? I mean, I, I won't go into the software problems that our city's already facing, uh, let alone buying and purchasing some more software. And by the time that rolls out, it's probably old anyway. So my position is proceed with clarity, a program, Let's reach out, Mr. City Manager. We need to do a better job at advocating with our county officials and saying, hey, we need that data. There's no reason why we should have a, a reinvention of the will to, to create an inventory system when the county already has one. Um, and the outreach teams, um, I'm surprised, alarmed, amazed that the, there were two outreach teams and one team rescinded the funds. Um, I say put them on our naughty list. We need to continue to move forward with members who want to participate and be proactive. So I'll let staff decide those decisions and this future council on that, but I really do appreciate your, your, your spirit, your heart. Thank you tonight. My line of questioning is more of a sincerity. I won't be here for but 60 more days. I wish the city the best. The wellness center that I had proposed three years ago um, it seemed to fall on deaf ears, but I'm glad that this community is looking forward to something. I think the location on 6th Street would be fabulous. I think that's a win for the city. Is that city-owned property? Yeah. I'll take that. It's owned by the Water District, sir. It's owned by the Water District. So, in essence, yes, it is our property, but it's the waters. Um, and so... We, uh, we look forward to that. Thank you very much. Um, we'll open it up to members of the uh, City Council. Uh, Mr. Reynoso, sir. I'll be really brief. Um, Cassandra, thank you for this. I don't know why, well, obviously, they cry, the city cried bankruptcy. We were bankrupt for a long time, so I imagine why they didn't prioritize this, even though it should have been one. Um, 
thank you for this presentation. I'll keep my questions brief because you answered everything and I was taking notes. Um, I guess my real questions here are, when you talked about the November ask for the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan, you were talking about this November, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, love that. Um, and then to Ms. Ortiz, to Dr. Ortiz's comment, and I guess, Mr. Freeman, you can weigh in on this as well. Um, we've only had a minimal experience with state of emergency around other things like racism is a public health crisis, but I wanted to know, does the county have to issue it first before the city can declare that? Because that does, I know better than anything else, that that opens up the floodgates for money that is available to us. And would that help you? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Renizel. Yes, actually, I echo the sentiments that it will be necessary to move forward with a state of emergency pertaining to our shelters and housing. And the reason why is because of zoning restrictions. And so we do need to streamline our ability to build units that are safe and affordable. And uh, yeah, I do intend to continue to research this because I will need to bring this back to council for approval. And this has to be, when you're speaking of zoning, we've got so much industrial. It has to be in residential? Well, if you uh, move forward with a state of emergency, it gives you flexibility. It could be commercial residential. It doesn't necessarily have to be industrial. And also for state and federal funding, you have to be careful because they do not want you to have units that are out in the middle of nowhere. It has to be within a certain, certain radius. I want to say one and a half to two miles of public transit, stop, shops, stores, things of that nature. Honestly, you answered all my questions. Um, I've learned more here today than I have in a long time. So thank you, that's it. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to other council members. Uh, council Member Barra. Thank you, Cassandra. I am very happy with the work you're doing with our city. This is a long time coming. Uh, for those who don't know, before I became uh, an elected official, I used to help do cleanups at Seccom Lake Park, and I was a commissioner for the um, Community Development Advisory Committee. and. One of my duties was to interview the applicants for funding on CDBG, ESG from the city. That was one of my tasks as a com commissioner. And what we found out that was happening at the Access Center at Sikkim Lake Park was that different jurisdictions were dropping off homeless into the park in the middle of the night, telling them, wait out here until Monday morning when they open this facility, go in and ask for services. They have a restroom, they have lockers. And when I talked to the members that were inside that facility, I asked them if they do outreach and talk to the members outside the park. They said, nope, they have to come inside the access center for us to give them help. It, it got to the point, for those who don't know, that there were many mayors at Sikkim Lake Park. These were people that were preying on the vulnerable population of homeless. They were sectioning sec areas of the park to themselves, and if anybody wanted to camp in that area, they were charging them just to set up. This was happening at Seccom Lake Park, you guys. And I see this happening at the Sports University and other locations are around the city. We need to stop those people preying on the vulnerable. Um, in my ward, for example, I have, and I, and I have brought this to staff's attention, we have what we call halfway homes or transitional housing within the second ward. And what we have found out is that yes, they'll take in people into their facilities, try to rehab them, but the moment they, go, they show up late or they go in with under the influence of drugs or alcohol, they send them into our streets. And that's something that I've asked staff to look into the CUPs that these facilities have been allocated. There's some that are operating without conditional use permits as well in our city. So if we're concerned about Sports University, just know that there's many more properties out there. A lot I brought to the staff's attention. Um, so I'm very happy that we're doing this. We did not have the funding before. When I came into office, the city was not in a f uh, fiscally stable situation. But just know that I've been keeping an eye out on the homeless and I'm trying to come, come up with solutions. Uh, a couple years ago, I sent an email out for pallets, pallet homes. I know Riverside, the city of Riverside built pallet homes for the homeless and they're currently building 10 tiny homes also that have almost every, every amenity that you can think of for a single person. So we're on the right track. Um, I already told Cassandra, she has my full support. I remember when ARPA uh, breakdown came before us, um, 
I, I ask that we increase the amount from 100,000 towards homelessness to the million. I think we have, I, I, I don't remember if it was a million or, or three million that we have set aside, but Cassandra said it might be, we're gonna need more. We're gonna, so she does have my support because that is who I want to help, especially people who want to get help and they don't wanna be in the streets. I also am upset when I hear about these landlords who are hiking up their rents we don't have rent control, but at the same time, there, there has to be something, something within the state that allows us to limit how much we, uh, landlords can hike up their rents. Because we're talking about going from 800 to 1,000 for a one bedroom in some locations. Um, so just, just know that we are aware. We are aware and, I, and Always, I know staff, they're probably tired of me emailing them, hey, Paris Hill Park is getting a surplus of, of more encampments, like people can't enjoy the parks anymore. It's like, what are we doing to address this? Um, tiny homes, the mobile showers, um, offering employment opportunities to, to those who want to get jobs and they can't, they can't get a job. Those are steps forward that we are um, providing. Also, I want to um, I, I want to clarify this this first section. I think you said it was countywide numbers. I think this is a city city numbers, right? Uh, because yes. county, I think it was three thousand total on house. Yes, that's strictly for our city. In our city, yes. correct. Um, I did a point in time count this year, you guys, and we have uh, I I found some that came here from other cities and are homeless in our city. That's something else that I've asked staff, that we ask our, the providers who we give money, ESG money to, to give us reports of who they're serving at their facilities. That way we have an opportunity to also ask those jurisdictions, those other cities in our area that are bringing them here for their fair share as well to help us. If they don't want to take care of them, we'll take care of them, but they need to put their part as well. Well, we need to put somebody, we need to hold somebody accountable, not just the county mayor. There's other jurisdictions, cities in our area that are dropping off homeless or giving them one-way tickets into our city. Those can probably be found in those reports from um, the, all the agencies that have received ESG funding from us. Um, I was even asking when, when, I, when I had two council members from two different cities brag to me that they're giving them tickets to our city. I, I, uh, I said, well, how about if I, if I find a person that came from your city, how about our city go to your city and ask for 100,000 per year to help that person off the street? Their jaws dropped. <laughs> They're like, no, never mind. But that's something that we have to do as a legislative body. We need to come up with um, something to tell our neighboring cities and the county that we need the help and if they don't want to help us, then we need to do what Santa Ana did in Orange County. Go after them as well, so we can build a, a facility to help them all. Um, I have several, several more, hold on, hold on. I gotta go through all, all, all the pages. Uh, I commend Community Action Partnership on your mobile shower. I do have a question. Is there anybody from Community Action Partnership here that can speak? Cheryl? She walked out? I had some questions on the mobile showers, but okay. I'll, I'll have to call them. <laughs> um, okay, I know we mentioned Lutheran um, Social Services. Um, uh, another uh, church that has approached me in my district on G Street also is the Seventh-day Adventist. Um, they wanted to actually build a wellness center, Mayor, um, one that would provide jobs to homeless individuals as well um, as they work there, a gym, a, a, a smoothie bar, um, to get them off the streets and give them a, a proper job. So if you can contact, I'll give you um, pastor's name. Um, that was a great idea. That's his vision. And I wouldn't mind having that there at, at um, Seventh-day Adventist. The other thing, if possible, if um, for these Lutherans um, uh, on G and, and Virginia, I know they mainly serve uh, men right now. Are they willing to house families? Because they're, they are surrounded by residential and an elementary school nearby. It would be nice to actually have families that are getting stable going to those units that they're planning on building next, like in the backside. That would be 
nice if they would consider it. I know you mentioned men with children, because we do have men with children out there, but it would be nice for families to, be, to stay together. Are you asking me that question? Are yes. You, okay, if yes. You, so if you have in, that conversation with them. Yeah, in full transparency, Lutheran Social Services would cater to men and men with children. But remember on the uh, slide that I showed you, our homeless men outnumber homeless women two to one. And a lot of times, uh, it's very difficult to find places for our men to go into. So there is actually a need for a men's shelter. With children, right? With Single children. men or men with children, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just want to make sure that we give it. Okay, I put Seventh Day Adventist already. Thank you. Um, I'm okay with the with having the navigation center. People need a navigation center. I know. Um, prior to me being elected, there was conversation of having um, like a village built in a county area, but at the same time having a wraparound services like counselors on site. And if we can have something even bigger, that can help us. So thank you for bringing this to us. Um, and then I was just telling council member, when you mentioned the, the sizes of the tiny homes, 170 square feet, I thought that was the size of his home, but he, he clarified it's 500 square feet. So either way, these are wonderful for single people and people with pets. Thank you for bringing these um, to us because like I said, the tiny homes that Riverside's building has the, the restroom, the kitchen, a little living, living room space, and they can have their own pets there. It's, a, it's gonna be a village. It's something, something that we, we should also bring forth. Homelessness with dignity. <laughs> um, also, I had a question though. The, um, the tiny homes that we are building for actual families, are we offering them uh, an option to purchase them? Because, because when, when landlords are asking for three times their, their wages in order to get the place, um, I don't know if I mentioned it here, when I, when I helped um, with rental assistance through one of the agencies I worked with before, I found out that some of these people that were facing uh, possible evictions, they had like their sons and daughters co-sign for them on those leases. The sons and daughters lived elsewhere and if they remove themselves from the lease, their parents wouldn't be able to live in those apartment units. Um, so we need to find a way to help um, and them as well, so that way they're um, sufficient, or you know they have the income, and that if, if we can manage the rent to avoid them going to those landlords that are going to ask them for uh, extortionary amounts of for rent or income, that we that they have that option to follow us. Um, but yeah, I, you have my support, Cassandra. I already told you, it's like we, we have to address it. When people were interviewed and surveyed about how they wanna use the sales tax, the number one concern was homelessness. And that is why I, I said that's, that's all we see. Those are the complaints that we're getting. Besides crime, we are getting a lot of messages for homelessness. People, uh, businesses and homeowners, residents, tenants, everybody who visits us. That's the one thing they see as they come into our city. So you have my full support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kim Calvin. Thank you very much uh, and good evening to everybody. Um, this was a fabulous presentation, very, very long overdue. And uh, I'm just emotional sitting here listening to all of this information, knowing that it is exactly what we have needed and, um, um, and that it is attainable, which makes it be uh, you know, a little bit even tougher for me um, because there's just no reason why we have not been on the journey um, to fulfilling um, this, for creating the doors that we need so that people can get inside and be able to have their own permanent housing, whether it's transitional, permanent, on the way to, whatever it is, every city around us has been moving in the direction that they have been needing to, and I just don't find that there is too many excuses for us to have not, but I am definitely grateful and happy that we are on this journey, and thank you for what you have brought to the table today and the entire department. I appreciate that. Now, I do want to ask about our housing element plan. Where are we with that? Uh, great question, Council Member. Uh, so as you know, and I think the, the whole council knows, we are, we are tardy. It was due last October. I'm sorry, we are, we are tardy with our housing element. Uh, we are, call it, a year behind. 
Uh, we have been communicating with our friends up in HCD regularly. We recently submitted the first two chapters of the housing element. We met with them yesterday to discuss our progress. Uh, and we recently, uh, again, yesterday had a very uh, constructive conversation with them. Uh, we were also able to meet on Tuesday with the Inland County Legal Services, which is also actively watching uh, what the city is doing in this regard. It's our intent to uh, have a draft of the housing element completed before the end of the year and an adoption first quarter of 2023. And with that, uh, the adoption in 2023, just for the public's education, let them know what that means. And so what, what does that um, allow for us to do at that time? How, do, how are we able to serve the community better? Just give them a little brief information on that. So the, the housing element are, articulates you know, where housing can go. Uh, it also contemplates potential rezoning of properties to allow for the production of more housing. It doesn't mean the city is actually going to produce the housing, but we're allowing for the future production of housing. Some of the, the consequences of potentially not having your housing element in uh, is the jeopardization of funds that could be used to procure more housing. So very, very important, correct? And I'm very happy to hear that we're now on track and those dates we will be able to hold um, you to. Where is it now? Is it in the planning department? Is that, is that who works with that? Yes, our planning department is the, the lead group behind the housing element. Okay, thank you so very much. I appreciate it. I, I'll be keeping my eye on it as well. I noticed that in the plan you didn't list the school district as one of our um, partners, and I know that that is essential. Uh, back in May, I was able to take um, a cohort of community members and other stakeholders um, to the city of Orange County. Uh, we viewed some affordable housing there, and one of the projects that we went to um, had a building that was directly uh, used for uh, scholars and their families that were um, unsheltered. Um, have we reached out to the school district? Yes, actually, Councilmember Calvin, I just didn't want to. Uh, uh, so basically, I've had several conversations, both with the county who is interested, in, who is interested in partnering with us. They have what's called Pacifica Village, and they have approximately six acres. Um, and so, yeah, they had mentioned the likelihood of a partnership. With that same token, we also talked with the school district that has 10 acres of land. And they are looking to do something similar with uh, students and their families, but they could partition off a section of that space for a navigation rec uh, recuperative care center for adults and uh, other homeless demographics. Um, the only thing is, is that it's just been discussions at this point, and although I welcome discussions, the housing division and the city welcomes these discussions, and we will continue to move forward. The city is not putting all of its eggs in one basket. So yes, we are open to those partnerships, but if they do not come to fruition, I think the city should still move forward with or without them. Absolutely. So my next question is, um, when we listed, when you listed the, the slide that uh, Gabe broke down some demographics of who actually is homeless, um, I, you didn't have seniors there. Do we have any yes. numbers on how many seniors in our city that are homeless? Yes, actually we do. So our highest concentration of homeless individuals are between, like I said, the ages of 25 through 39. That's 40% followed immediately by individuals who are 49 through 59. So um, we have homeless seniors, but surprisingly, they were our fourth category. Now, one homeless senior is too much, but it's not in the top demographic. It's more of the younger population that seems to be homeless in our city. Okay, thank you very much. I was also really happy to hear that uh, the project at Valley College will be also used for the TAY program because we also know that um, scholars or young people that are exiting out of foster, the foster system are definitely in need of an affordable place to live. So um, the homeless outreach team, um, how many of those do you, do you attest that we would need in our city? for the 62 square miles coverage. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I've talked to several organizations and I'm surprised that they didn't give me higher numbers for 60 square miles. So on average, we're looking anywhere from 10 to 12 workers teaming up in teams of two that would cover various populations they would divide, subdivide it off. And so with that said, they can have it so that even though you may have um, individuals spread out throughout the city, should there be a crisis or an emergency, they have a system in place where they can come together collectively. And mind you, even though the city would have its own dedicated homeless outreach team, 
we would still work with our local nonprofits and our neighbors. We wouldn't exclude them because we have our own. So that was my next question. Mm -hmm. um, and so would our local nonprofits be able to become a vendor then for the district in order, um, for the district, for the city in order to provide this work? So we could still utilize, let's say, ESG funding like we've done before and still bring in our local nonprofits to help with shelter, to help with uh, homeless prevention and homeless outreach. They don't need an MOU agreement. It would be the same conditions that currently exist. The difference is, is that with the homeless outreach team, they are accountable fully to the city to provide for the comprehensive needs. Homeless outreach, although we do have it, they're kind of limited in what they can offer. We ha hiring a third party contractor to do homeless outreach for us would list the housing navigation component. It would list connecting individuals to motels if shelters were not available. It would provide transportation assistance. It would assist them with medical appointments and mental health. It would just be more comprehensive than what's traditionally provided currently. Thank you very much. So you mentioned also too about the county um, and I, I just didn't, wasn't writing fast enough. And the two projects that, or the two vendors or, uh, that they received like 4.5 million. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Could you just refresh me on that one really quickly? Yeah, so our county actually re uh, recently received funding. It's called the COC Homeless Project. And these are for n brand new homeless, not existing. You have to be a brand new project that provides assistance to homeless individuals. Um, the city received a little over 15, I'm sorry, the county received a little over $15 million. Um, we have some great organizations in the city, but apparently there are not a whole lot of new projects. And so as a result, there were only two applicants, which made it easy to fund those two applicants and they each received close to 4.3 or $4.5 million each. So um, with that being said, the amount of money that right would, that is left, right? What we do know is that the county does have plenty of funds to be able to assist the city of San Bernardino. Absolutely, Correct? and that's just one pot. There's HHAP. There's a plethora of funds, PLHA, all of that. So I, I don't want to speculate as to why they have not uh, and are not knocking on our door to see what it is that we need, recognizing um, even the. Uh, situation on 4th Street. Um, I'm not going to speculate about that, but what I will say is that I don't see how that they are not um, knocking on our door uh, to say, what can we do? We are here to assist in every way possible. We, you don't have to chase us. You don't have to call us out over the dais. We should be able to make sure that you all are taken care of because you are the county seat. We share these uh, constituents and there is no reason for why we should have anybody that is unhoused with the amount of money that this county of San Bernardino has in their coffers. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Alexander, sir. Thank you, I appreciate it. Appreciate your presentation. Um, as far as other cities dropping off uh, homeless into our cities, can you make sure that gets put into our, um, our, our system or our county citywide system? Because I agree with Council Member uh, Bar uh, Ibarra on that. Um, maybe we can do something like, uh, since everybody is always suing everybody, maybe we could uh, get legal counsel up there to see that people that drop our people off here. And maybe we can get with the county the sheriff's department that we know that drops off those who get out of uh, West Valley Detention Center that we know, it's not, it's not if we don't know, it's not speculation, we know that drops them off into the city. So if they can reach out and talk to them. I don't know if that's you. I don't know if that's Nathan. I don't know who's that. Well, whoever, somebody, staff, reach out to the county and say, "Hey, maybe we can get uh, an agreement for them to stop doing that." That that would that would be helpful. I appreciate that. Oh, I see the assistant city attorney writing down. Thank you, sir. Before you come back with that, because it does no need for us to do all of this, and the spigot doesn't stop. It, if it doesn't stop. Um, I didn't see anything about pets because we all know everybody loves pets and we cannot house them if we don't have a, somewhere to 
Did you mention pets? What, are we mentioning pets now? Okay, all right, roger that. I'm good, Merry Christmas. Um, policing, how are we gonna police this particular area if we do this? What kind of safety measures are in fact if we're gonna, if we're gonna do this? I don't want this to turn into you know, escape from New York. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's speak of the Navigation and Recuperative Care Center. That definitely would have security components, but not just individuals walking. We're talking high level. So uh, in the navigation centers that are currently erected, you have onboard um, camera systems, uh, but it doesn't look institutionalized. So they're kind of in a discreet manner because you don't want individuals to feel like I'm being every my every move is being watched but there is a security presence and then there's also the lead operators tend to incorporate what's called a good neighbor policy because wherever a navigation or recuperative care center is located it's going to be roughly adjacent to some neighborhood some kind of way and so basically what they do is they have either a direct email phone number where individuals in the community can call call with concerns call with questions and those uh, are generally responded to within 24 hours and then because of it's a good neighbor policy they typically have open door tours so individuals in the neighborhood could schedule a tour where everything is transparent you can walk through you can see the services that are being provided you can have some input in terms of volunteering we want it to be communal where it's uh, it's community based everyone has a hand in it it's something that has ownership not just by individuals who are homeless but individuals in the community who are happy to have something in place to assist those who are vulnerable so how is this going to impact our PD that's that's what I want that's what yeah. I want to know because you know they're gonna call for services they're gonna call PD so have you guys taken an account of that so typically what happens is yes you do have on-site security police if necessary, absolutely work in with the security agreement. So it's not just like a lead operator that says, oh, I need X amount of cameras or I need X amount of security guards. Typically on a navigation center, that lead operator works closely with the local PD department to make sure that all angles of, of uh, all levels of security are met. If police presence is necessary, they will call, but typically with navigation centers, that's really not necessary. They, I'm not talking they about have... navigation centers. Oh, so what are I'm, you referring I'm, to? I'm talking about when you build this on option one or option two. Yeah, that's the, the housing navig... element. Okay. No, so I wasn't referring to the housing element. The option one and option two was the navigation center. It was well, just giving that... the layouts of how many units, whether right. we go 100, 200, that's, it was right. just giving that option. Right, so I was just saying, you know, if, if who's going to supervise, who's going to protect that, who's going to do the safety around that. Not you, When I hear navigation center, I look at a little small building, oh, and yeah. then the wraparound services are around that particular building. Yeah, so to be clear, when you seen the option one and two, uh -huh. that was the navigation center. That okay. whole campus of would be a facility to assist individuals who are homeless and those who are at risk of homeless. Right. Okay. And that just kind of okay. outlined the units. Yeah. Okay, I got it. This has been asked me one, but maybe a hundred times by various residents in the city. They always say, hey, council member, can you take a building that the city owns and rehab that building and make it work for transitional housing? Can you explain that to the public? Because I, I get that a million times and I'm not the SME. <laughs> Trust me, when I first arrived here to the city, I was looking for low-hanging fruit. How, what is available that we could utilize mm -hmm. to quickly deploy housing, interim housing, navigation centers, what have you? And although the city has quite a bit of land, surplus land, there really was no viable building to convert or utilize. Now, we do know we have a convention center, and we do know that there are vacant buildings but it was not ideal, or the building itself was just in extremely poor repair. Um, it, it just was not financially sound and it wasn't safe, and we have to think about public health and safety when we move forward with things like this. Thank you. Um, the normal, now, Director Freeman, you said that this is gonna go through the normal processing plan, planning and all that? So uh, I'll use the El Centro uh, example that I brought up earlier. So in that situation, the city had a piece of property, very similar to what we have, uh, and they entered into a lease agreement uh, with a private developer, the one that procured the units, 
and that private developer had to go through the city's usual process. And when I say the county and the school district were involved, uh, they were in the, the overall management. So think of like your, your college dorm. So when you were talking about security on a, in a uh, community like that, you have a resident advisor, you also have a security guard. And again, the, the school district has a vested interest in making sure these folks are safe uh, and that uh, they're actively involved. So when I say there's several different ways to do this, going through the normal process using the El Centro model, absolutely yes. Uh, the developer, if we were to lease the property to them or even sell it to them, would have to go through the process. Now, I, I really don't like that. If, if we're all saying this is an urgent matter, why are we not waving and streamlining this to that particular urgency? So we would do everything in our power uh, to... Is that your power or is it our power? Can council... Well, um, I'm referring on staff side. We would right. do everything within our ability uh, to expedite projects like this. Okay, that's, that's what I'm saying. To move it to the front, if, 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 if this is the will, the political will of the council, can we move this to the front instead of just getting in getting behind any other projects or anything that's, that's come yeah, before uh, it. Of course, you know, we're, we're talking about the housing element. Staff has a vested interest in procuring more housing in our community. So yes, we would absolutely prioritize that. And if we don't get this uh, state of emergency and the changing of zoning and stuff like that, how do we address that? So uh, as an example, if uh, the state of emergency were not to happen and someone were to come and say, I want to buy a piece of city property that isn't necessarily zoned uh, for a housing use, uh, they could apply for a zone change, which would have to go through the planning commission and then to the city council for ultimate approval. So there but, are options. But I mean, for the homeless, I, I mean, I know government can move fast when it wants to, when it has a political will, and that means everybody that's sitting in these seats back here when we want to do something, because I've worked in government, so I know we can move expeditiously if the council says and directs so. So I just want to know, and I just, and everybody else wants to know, if we direct so and say move and move expeditiously, how fast, what timeline? Because what's, what's the timeline? So again, as Cassandra, Hi hypothetically, hypothetically. So uh, as Cassandra alluded, uh, we are right, based on the results of this conversation this evening. We're going to be bringing back some more concrete uh, recommendations to the council. Again, based on you know the feedback we get from you. Uh, theoretically, if you were to tell us to move on the School of Hope site, we would have to immediately enter into a lease with the Water District. Uh, Real Property Services is now part of Community Economic Development. Uh, we would move uh, as quickly as we could to secure that. We would have to bring that lease back to the council for your consideration, assuming you approve that. Uh, then the real work would begin. So uh, it, it's hard to say. We can move pretty fast, um, especially if it's, it, it depends on what the ownership is and who the underlying developer will be. If it's a city project on government-owned land, it's not going through an entitlement process necessarily. We'll have to go through CEQA, I'm sure, but we can do a lot of things in parallel instead of, as in, se instead of in sequence. So we can move it very quickly. It's a question of you know, getting, getting design work done and contracting the work out. But in terms of actually getting through an entitlement process, you can go through design at the same time you're doing CEQA, and that's the only entitlement requirement that a, that a city has on its own kind of project. And we can work those similar angles, uh, I think, when it comes to doing a private project on a city-owned or a city-sponsored project. I mean, I th we'll have to work with the city attorney's office, obviously, but uh, we can move it very, very quickly if that's the, uh, if that's the council's pleasure. Your city manager's correct. We could do it quickly. Obviously, we have to follow state law, CEQA being the major, most important one. Uh, but council would need to make that decision to basically circumvent its own zoning rules and not go through the normal process. And that's a, that's a policy decision. It has its merits uh, and it has its downsides. And that's a decision uh, further in, in the future when this comes back. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, that's all the questions I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I, I want to 
respect uh, Councilman Alexander's passion and the urgency and the need, and I clearly understand that. Uh, the other flip side is that we also serve residents who are um, faced with the encumbrance of a proposed property. And so my, my suggestion is that we um, also have the noticing requirements to the general public. Um, so the council has provided some new direction on noticing requirements. I'm assuming that those would still stand for noticing requirements of the general public. Well, in a circumstance like this, the primary, let's say for the sake of argument somebody's going to object, yeah. the primary mechanism is through CEQA, more so than through, right. I mean, we can overburden ourselves with a full-blown, we can go, we can put ourselves through the full-blown planning process if we choose to. I don't think from a staff perspective we would recommend that. If, in fact, we are in a homeless emergency for the sake, you know, again, that has not been formally declared, but there are certain steps that we can and should take to expedite the development of these types of projects. So, no, we can, as I said, we can, we can follow whatever process we choose, but um, we, in some respects, even have kind of sovereignty when it comes to some of these things. It's like the county doesn't have to come to us for permission to do something. So it's going to be a count, it's going to be a policy decision well, on the I, part of the council. Where I'm so going with but this CEQA is, is, CEQA is not waivable. Where I'm this. going with this is is there were some members here that were actually advocating for increased the footage to be increased. Well, I disagreed with it originally six months ago, nine months ago, on the noticing requirements, and now it seems as though there's duplicity in it not being addressed. As, so I just think, you know, I'm calling a spade a spade. Let's have the noticing requirements that was um, advocated by members Let's continue on in urgency. I understand that there is an urgent requirement for it. And also that staff come back with state of emergency de de declaratory um, uh, opportunity for the council to declare that state of emergency and provide the authority of our city manager to, to enact and move forward. Um, I, I want to insist that we look at the language for the citizenship of the city and the homeless population, I think we need to, very similar to what, what Cal State or UC system, to be a, a, a in-state tuition, similar language that would allow for the, the opportunity so that Ms. Ibarra had even suggested that there's not just a drop-off situation and now they're our resident. Uh, that's not fair to the taxpayers that I represent. It's not fair to the community we represent. So I would want some restrictive language um, and, and we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, Mr. Charette, sir. Yeah, I, I'll try to be brief here. Um, I think the mayor just answered one of my questions that uh, city manager just brought up, and that is that we, there's not been a state of emergency declared. And my question was, who does that? We do that here. I mean, we can do that. So we should be doing that, I think. I think this is an emergency, and uh, I agree with that. I thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm anxious to see the... 58 page one and uh, and get into this you've given us a lot of uh, a, a lot of um, options here I, I you know I think uh, I think Nathan said it that uh, you're going to be coming back based on this beginning this is just the first step you'll be coming back with something a little more concrete we've got two or three options we can do this we can do that um, I would like to address a, a concern of why we haven't done this sooner. Um, I've been here longer than anybody, and there's something we went through that just almost de that put this city out of business for quite a number of years. It was called bankruptcy. We lost a lot of people. We're just now really with you coming on board. Uh, we didn't have somebody like you to really come in here and look at this and present this. It's always been an issue. Everyone's talked about it. Homelessness and crime are the two top issues. Um, and uh, we're all talking about it. We're all worried about it. We're all wanting to do something about it, but it hasn't been that easy until we've got the right people in place to carry out the tasks. Uh, and, and I think we have that now, and we can take this and move it. Another word that wasn't used here just a couple minutes ago was expedite. Um, we don't want to bypass. We don't want to do something that's wrong or break the law or anything. We want to expedite things, and these are things that need to be done uh, now that we've got kind of a plan going forward. Uh, and then, of course, the funds. Um, uh, somebody needs to call Governor Newsom because he's got $97 billion in a, uh, in a reserve fund, 
And uh, so we need the county at our table. Uh, we need a table full of partners here um, working collaboratively together to solve this issue. Um, I would love for the city of San Bernardino to be the lead. Uh, we'd make the national news. City of San Bernardino exits bankruptcy and um, solves the homeless problem. Uh, what a great headline that would be. Um, probably wishful thinking, but we can certainly work in that direction. So I think we're on the right track. Um, we do need to reach out to our partners. We need to reach out to the state. Ms. Brown, who left, I believe, um, she mentioned somebody, I don't know who it was, I don't know if it was the Secretary of the Treasury or what, but somebody up in Sacramento, we need those people down here. We do need them uh, partnering with us, and we need to put the pressure on the county and on the state and, and, and go for all these other uh, pots of money that are available. Because, you know, 425 people um, at $30,000 a year, I believe it came out to like uh, $15 million. Well, we don't have that sitting around. Um, and that's just for one year, and that's probably a low number. Uh, uh, 32? 32 million. I don't know. I wrote down 32 first, and then I put down 50, but 15. But at any rate, it's a, it's a lot. whole lot of money, and it's only temporary. It's not, you know, it goes on. This this issue goes on and on and on. And it, um, it isn't, I, I don't think we're going to solve the homeless issue with these tiny homes. People aren't going to live in those for, they're not going to raise families in those homes. We've got to, this is a temporary fix. And we've got to get these people off the street uh, and help them. Uh, but they've also got to be willing to help themselves. And um, that's that's largely... Uh, done through social services and uh, providing jobs and um, and working with people. And uh, the other thing that the governor has done, I haven't heard a lot about it, I guess it's been signed into law, and that is the CARE Court. And I think the CARE Court is going to be uh, a, a part, an element of this uh, so solving homelessness and getting these people off the streets. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the CARE Court is similar to the to the drug court that was established many years ago. And it, it gives municipalities a, the ability to get people off the street and get them into this court, that then the courts will take care of them. They'll move them into the services that are needed. Because, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of mental illness out there, drug problems. And incarceration certainly is not the answer. Um, but the but the drug court worked and is continuing to work and this care court i hope uh will maybe provide some of the same solutions and help to the problem so um, those are really my comments tonight uh, I, I think i think the primary thing is is that we give staff the opportunity to uh to boil this down and uh and bring this back a little bit uh more solid these are our recommendations not not uh, you can do this, 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 and this, and what do you like? Um, you're the experts, and you're the ones doing doing all the research. So um, uh, that, that's about all I really have to say. I do thank you very much for the presentation, and I'm glad to have you on set, on staff and 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 really be able to take this issue on and uh, and do what we can to certainly mitigate it um, and and deal with it the best we can. But let's be a leader. In, in doing so. But it is going to take an awful lot of money, an awful lot of money, and everybody needs to be prepared um, uh, to, to, there's only so much money out there. And so if we take it from here, we might have to give something up over here in order to fix something over here. So I think if everyone understands that, uh, we can move forward. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Charette. Um, what you've heard tonight are real solutions to the community's problems. It's been identified in a 2017-2018 <coughs> community survey as we uh, pondered the opportunity for the transition of a Measure Z to Measure S. The community um, wholeheartedly and uh, enthusiastically responded in the community survey provided by a third party um, statistician or survey company 
And the top five were certainly identified as homeless. In fact, uh, I remember as we entered in the new council in 2018, we contemplated uh, the survey. And so homelessness indeed was one of the top uh, concerns of the community. Tonight, what we've heard is some fantastic solutions and uh, some funding uh, mechanisms. We'll encourage staff to continue the, in earnest to um, provide those details in its uh, full uh, full uh, venue at w or full opportunity to, to uh, dissect it a little bit more. I think what you're hearing tonight, Ms. Searcy and Mr. City Manager, is direction to proceed and to return the council um, with uh, these options. Um, I think the opportunity is now and we need to continue to move forward in that stead and to um, ensure that we also codify these actions in a, a holistic plan so that when spring of 2023 comes that we can apply for a shovel ready project to the governor's office and the, the uh, NOFA and respond to it so that there will be uh, continued um, resources that we can pull down from our federal state and county officials. Uh, with that, we'll conclude. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Kelvin. Thank you, Mayor. I just had one more question as far as Lutheran Services, and you said that they had, it would be an additional 200 with their project, or is that going to be inclusive, what they have, and then the new project, it will total 200? That would be inclusive with what they have. So um, they're building 200 beds, and then their existing shelter location is going to be incorporated into support service office buildings, things of that nature, and they'll still have a separate house to provide shared housing. So most of that will be incorporated into support service office buildings. So it'll be 200 beds total that uh -huh. they will have. And currently they have how many? Currently, I think they have 70. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yes, 70. Okay. And one more thing. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on what Councilman um, Charette said by speaking about the issues and how and why people become homeless. We also, as a city, need to be uh, bringing forth our policies as to how we are going to deal with slumlords in our city as well. Because without dealing with, without dealing with the slumlords in our city, this is how we contribute, again, to homelessness, our very own selves. So I'll, I have requested that, and I'm awaiting those answers, Mr. City Manager. Okay, uh, Mr. Charette. Yeah, just very, very quickly, I don't want to miss an opportunity because this is an emergency and we need to declare it as soon as we can. My question is about that School of Hope property. Um, is there any, any need for us to move quickly on that? It, it appears that it's a good opportunity. And with that, if we had that today, is that considered shovel ready? No, actually there is about an acre and a half of land that is, I don't know if you've seen option one, that is completely flat in the back where we could utilize to put on modular units. Um, altogether it's two and a half acres, but we'd have an acre and a half to altogether probably put maybe a hundred units on, on an acre and a half in the and back. And you'd need shovels to flatten that land. Well, the so land's shovel flat. ready. Yeah, shovel ready then. <laughs> yeah. Well, and come on, and, I mean, I'm serious. It really depends uh, on which I'm options serious. Kick that property would be ready to get shovels out there and start I, working. I think we could make it shovel ready very quickly because yeah, there's an, exist, there's an existing building that can, can be converted so we can be done in, in phases. So I would say that it has the potential to be shovel ready in very short order. And I'm and I also and I'm also looking at that property. I'm not saying go get it tomorrow because uh, I want to make sure we do this, you know, thoughtfully uh, and that it, it really is appropriate, but I don't want to wait too long and and maybe miss an opportunity right and I, I do think that that if nothing else that's a start and it's going to show the state and anybody else that's looking at us the ACLU and anybody else that's looking at us that we're serious about this and we're working toward it right I mean there's that old saying that perfect is the enemy of, of good yeah we, we we can't wait on if we went on perfection we'll never do anything we, right. we don't want to be frozen you know we don't want paralysis you know analysis paralysis set in we're yeah so we understand absolutely Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, members of the public have had an opportunity to speak. We appreciate our public for being here tonight and we thank our audience in the Feldheim Library. We wanna say thank you very much for uh, all those viewing on Channel 3 and thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned and we thank you. Uh, drive home safely tonight.